check it one, two, check it one, two. Good morning, friends. Shabbat Shalom. We're going to get started because all of you beautiful people are here, and that's enough. I hope that your week has been tremendous and amazing, but as I always like to say, it doesn't matter anymore because that week is behind you, and now we're here on the best day, the Shabbat. So Shabbat Shalom to everyone, wherever you are. It's a joy, a pleasure, our privilege to celebrate this great day with you. I learned this song from uh, Travis Fisher. So since he's up here, welcome back, Ramon. Nice to have you. It doesn't feel quite so lonely. Now we just need you guys engaged. Shabbat Shalom. Here we go. I think we'll just play guitar solo for a while and that's it. Shalom, Yase 
Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Liam Ko Yisrael Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Liam Ko Yisrael Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Liam Ko Yisrael Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Biyalko Yisrael Just kidding, I'm always excited. Always excited to be here. Put new strings on my guitar though. It's a mixed blessing. This is a song about gratitude that we have every single day. Yeah. 
reaches to the heaven Your faithfulness stretches to the sky Oh, yeah, hallelujah, 
Seila, Seila. Set 
my mouth may declare your praise. Declare your praise. Declare your praise. Declare your praise. Adonai, it's for time. To the God who is faithful through all the generations. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Elohe Avoteinu Elohe Avraham Elohe Yitzchak Elohe Yaakov El Hagadol Hagibor Vehanora El El Yom Gomel Chasadim Tovim Vikone Hakol Vizocher Chasdei Avot Mevi go a leave never nehem le manchemo be a hava Melechoser Moshiachum again Baruchata Adonai Magain Avra To the God faithful to raise the dead Atagi Bole Lam Maronai Mechaye Metimata be Rabble Hoshia Mosh Morid Hata Michael Chaim Bechese, Michaye Metim Berachamim Rabim, Somech Noflim Berofech Oholim, Umati Rasurim, Um Kayem Munato Holi Shene Afa, Micha Mocha Baal Givurot, Umido Mela, Melech Memit, Um Chaye, Umats Miach Yeshua. Venemanata ha lechachayot meitim. Baruch ata Adonai mechaye ha To the God seated above the heavens. Kadosh, 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 Adonai tzvaot. Baruch ata Adonai ha el ha Kadosh. Mimkom chamakenu tofia v'tim loch alenu ki mechakim anachnu lach ay 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 matai tim loch God who gives us this day of rest and refreshing. Baruch Ata Adonai Mekadesh HaShabbat The God restoring His presence to Zion. Baruch Ata Adonai HaMachazir Shekhinato Le'etzion To the God worthy of all thanksgiving. 
ברוך אתה אדוני הטוב שמך ולחנה להודו God who grants us peace. Baruch Ata Adonai, Hamvarech et Amo, Yisrael, Ba'ashalom. When you pray, pray like this, he says. Avinu Shabba Shamayim, Yid Kadesh Mecha, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, the King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation. In Messiah, Yeshua, Amen. You may be seated. From us to you, a hearty Shabbat Shalom. Good to have you. You can give your offerings online right there at that link, and you can set them up to happen automatically. You can also give your gifts in the back of the synagogue there in the Sadaka box. One more tune. Oh, cool, I thought it sounded like the rumbling thunder of the psalms as God rolls. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael Chai 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 Old Abinu Chai, Old Abinu Chai Old Abinu, Old Abinu, Old Abinu Chai 
Shabbat Shalom, good morning. Thank y'all so much for uh, joining us here today. The left side of the room, I'm surprised the building's not doing this. You know, so are y'all scared to sit on the left side of the house today? And so, but anyway, thank y'all so much for joining us today. We really appreciate y'all being here in person and online. We really appreciate it. So speaking of online, we'd like to welcome Petty, Peggy Judkins from uh, Muskegee, Oklahoma. Kim Larson from Devon, uh, Pennsylvania. Christy Holtz from Iowa. Christy Westbrooks from East Texas. Pamela Hockenberry from Coldwater, Michigan, David Van Zant from Lima, Ohio, which he and his wife are celebrating their 38th wedding anniversary. So mazel tov to them. Jackie uh, Boltz from uh, Laurel, Maryland. Mark Gildez, who's on the road today joining us instead of from California. Ruth Eubanks from Mississippi, Ed and Kathy Tracy from Anchorage, Alaska. Mark and uh, Corey from Ripken, California. Carrie Casebuyer from Crocker, Mississippi. The Maggard family from Warner Robins, Georgia. The uh, Bowser's families from Miss, Miss Ocko, uh, Miskawaka, <laughs> Indiana. At least I didn't mess their name up, I hope. Anyway, uh, Jen Cripps from East, the East Coast of Canada and the Turner family in Albany, Georgia. So, um, well, as many of you know, I travel every week for my work. And so I have taken to putting out where I'm going to be at this, this upcoming week. But last week I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma area and i got to meet these fine folks right here uh we spent about an hour and a half sitting around yakking in the hotel lobby lobby not lobby <laughs> uh it was uh kent and chris grass barbara johnson deborah uh, uh oh she told me 15 times how to say her name <laughs> tana uh tankofer uh elena Peckery and Bruce and Barb Davis. Thank you guys for coming and visiting with me. I was expecting about three and seven showed up, so it just really blew me away. Y'all blessed me immensely by, by doing that, and we had a good time. Now, see the uh, Elena in the back row there making the funny face? She hardly said two words the whole time we were talking, and so then she decided to show her personality when the picture was being taken, so that was great. <laughs> so. And uh, last week we had Tour on Tap, and we had our highest number of people attending. In, online and in person, we had 27 men joining us. It was absolutely fantastic. So looking forward to next month's Tour on Tap. And, but this week I will be in Harrisburg, North Carolina, and I will have some time available on Tuesday evening if anybody's in that area and would like to uh, meet with me. Gee. Uh, fifteen dollars. <laughs> hey, that is a good idea, Richard. <laughs> That'll be our uh, our building campaign fund. Yeah. <laughs> so there we go. Um, we have a tour club today at 1:30. You can join us here or online. If you are a member of a tour club group, you are more than welcome to join us online. Or, or here, but if you are interested in joining Torah Club, you can come and visit us for a couple times and see if it's something that you like. And uh, Camp Drote is coming up on June 25th. Very excited about that. If you still uh, haven't volunteered yet and need to be voluntold, see Sabrina. She will take care of that. Um, if you have not uh, subscribed to our YouTube page, please do. And when you do that, hit the like button. That really helps us out. The more likes and subscriptions we get really just gets our message out. And please share. Share that amongst your friends on Facebook and all that good fun stuff. And uh, just, uh, we have an online event for the first time. Um, I've 
tomorrow for the Euro Europe Shalomis Hangout. This is, that's fantastic that they have taken the time to get together with a Zoom meeting in, in their area so that they can get to know each other and hopefully like each other. Anyway, that will be tomorrow at 1 p.m. for all of those in the Europe area. You can uh, go through our uh, Shalom at Home page to get access to that. So thank you, Shabbat Shalom. And I think we have um, a couple people who, uh, dip, come on up, guys. <laughs> that need to share Hi. <laughs> Who am I? I'm Anya Hucky, Darren's daughter. Um, <laughs> both of them. Um, so I wanted to come up here and talk about what is going to be happening in about a month. So we're going to be going to Honduras for a missions trip with um, Mike Brown and Elite Teams. We're going to help support the local community and keep kids out of gangs. And we are going to be building a roof over a schoolyard to help the kids stay out of the heat. Um, so we can't wait and really excited. Um, for clarification, it's me, Boaz, my younger brother, and Anya who are going um, from here. I assume there's going to be more than us three, but um, yeah, way too much for three people. Um, you can help support us uh, through the donations link in the Shalom Macon website, uh, in the memo area, and write Honduras mission trip, mission trip. The cost for each of us going is 100, no, 100, mm -hmm. $1,500 each for us three. And we would appreciate it very, very much. I myself have been looking forward to it a lot, so it'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, kiddos, let's go to Shabbat school. Yisimcha Elohim ke Ephraim v'chi Menashe. May the Lord make you like Ephraim and Menashe. Yisimech Elohim ke Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Valea. May the Lord make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Father, a blessing for all of our children. We ask for your favor. We ask, we're thankful that those kids that were once kids, they're not kids, they're young adults who were kids up here who got blessed are now taking it out. We ask, Father, that you would help us to raise up many, many more like them who are going to serve in the kingdom around the world. All right, you can go to class. So I, I had a revelation this week, which is not a word that I use very frequently because that's a pretty powerful word. Um, <clears throat> but I gave the message last week that was about listening to other people, right? Letting them derail you from your purpose, from your BHAG, 
your big, hairy, audacious goal, your BHAG. We looked at the Torah portion last week to illustrate that, right? They were, they were headed for the promised land and the complainers started doing what they do. And the next thing you know, even Moses was derailed from his purpose and was begging God to kill him. That's what was happening. And I talked to you last week about not letting them get you down. And that was it. And that was the message. It's a one-parter. No continuation. That's it. I had moved on in my mind. So in my office, I was preparing this week's message. I was sitting at my desk, at my desk, looking out the window, thinking, and then I saw this. That's my window. And the revelation dropped. Again, a dramatic word. But that's what it was. I only told you half the story last week. That was what I realized. I told you what they do, the complainers, the grumblers, <coughs> the BHAG derailers. And I told you, don't let them get you down. But there's a whole nother side of that story. I didn't equip you. I didn't give you any practical tools or awareness of how to actually combat that, which is probably the most important part. So, welcome to the unplanned part two, who are you listening to? Perfectly, though, perfectly inspired, as usual, by the Torah portion we read this week, which is Shalach, and who gets sent where? spies into the land. Because without what I'm going to teach you today, you will never succeed in not letting them get you down. You will never be able to do it. That's a big statement. Now listen, to say what I'm going to stand up here and say, I probably should have a PhD in psychology or some like clinical practice. I don't, so I have to be careful. I'm going to rely on 50, almost 51 years of life a lot of Bible study, and a lot of ancient and modern wisdom that I have collected through the years and a lot of life experience. But here's the thing. To teach you how to really be the best version of yourself and to battle the enemy that will take you out of this game completely, and I'm not talking about death, but when you succumb to the tactics of this enemy, you're as good as dead, Last week was about the people around you, but there's a worse dream killer. There's a worse goal crusher. There's a worse happy life killer. And it's way worse than them because it's you. And it's inside your head. Let me explain the video. Darren, restart that video for me, please. Let me explain this and what it showed me. This is the interstate. This is my window. Those are cars. And that little tiny space right there is what I can see of the interstate from my car window when I'm sitting in my office. I can see those cars going by at 80 miles an hour. This is also a picture of your mind. The interstate is your mind. The cars are your thoughts. And that tiny little space is the level of perspective that we often have regarding our thoughts. Now let me explain. Let me ask you, how many thoughts do you have in a day? Thousands. There's no way to scientifically figure that out. There's no great answer, but thousands that come speeding into your brain from anywhere and everywhere, from input sources, your own, from your own random generations of pondering everywhere, and you have very little control over them. You cannot possibly tell me what you're going to think next. And I can tell you to think something, and then you'll think about it, and where will your thoughts go from there? No one knows. 
like those cars speeding by 80 miles an hour or higher, that's our brain, awake, alert, thinking thoughts constantly. And when those thoughts are positive, good thoughts, constructive, productive thoughts, we're in a good place. Even when we have a negative thought, when we let it pass by like one of those cars, Literally, in the blink of an eye, through the bushes in the video, when we allow our negative thoughts to just be, to be, and to accept them as reality, but then let them move out of our mind, we encounter them as briefly as that car going by that little tiny space. And we are in a good space when we do that. You can stop that video. But that is not our tendency. Instead, we grab a thought, particularly from those input sources that are negative. We grab it. For example, someone makes a critical comment about you, and in your mind, the thoughts start speeding down your brain's interstate highway or our assumptions, our preconceived biases, rather than considering that we have those and that this thought may be emerging from absolutely wrong information and have no relevance, that this thought may be absolutely illogical or irrational, instead of recognizing that it is one of a hundred speeding cars a minute passing down the interstate, we grab it. And we hold on to it. Like, imagine, like me going out to the side of the interstate, grabbing one of those cars. I have a rope, a chain around my waist. It's tied securely. On the other end is a super-powered electromagnet. And I run to the side of the interstate, and I wait. And when one comes, I throw the magnet. <laughs> clang! Poof! And where am I? Being dragged 80 miles an hour down the interstate by something I have no control over and had absolutely no idea where it's taking me. I'm out of control. I've completely lost it. My friends, this is too often our life when it comes to our thoughts. And I can talk every Shabbat for the next five years about being the best version of yourself and don't let them get you down and put your head down and keep pushing. But until we master our thoughts and the power and control that they have over our happiness and the lives we live, we'll never succeed at being the people we want to be or the people God wants you to be. And we will miss blessing after blessing. And this Torah portion, Shalach, it's my favorite psychological Torah portion because what I'm describing to you is exactly what we see happen. Exactly. Send agents to scout the land of Canaan. I'm going to talk for a little while today. Is that okay? Send agents to scout the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelite people. Send one participant from each of their ancestral tribes, chieftains among them, by Adonai's command. Send agents to scout the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelite people. That's how it starts. That was the fact of the matter. I am giving this to you. Do this thing. It's going to happen. And at the end of 40 days, they returned from scouting the land. They went straight to Moses and Aaron and the whole community. They made their report. This is what they told him. We came to the land you sent us to. It does indeed flow with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. And there's your brain. However, however, the people who inhabit the country are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we say Anakites. We saw Anakites there. Caleb is watching this happen. Caleb, the master of his thoughts in this situation, is watching it happen. And he says, no, 
He hushed the people before Moses and said, Let us by all means go up and we shall gain possession of it, for we shall surely overcome. But the other men who had gone with him said, We cannot attack that people, for it is stronger than we. They spread calumnies among the Israelites about the land they had scouted, saying, The country that we traversed and scouted is one that devours its settlers. All the people that we saw in it are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The Anakites are part of the Nephilim. And we looked like grasshoppers to ourselves and surely to them. So we must have looked to them. Why? 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 Look at the presumption that's occurring here. First, the country is one that devours its settlers. How do we know that? Where'd that come from? Second, they don't know how they looked to those people. How many people struggle with what people think about them because they create a perception in their minds we look like grasshoppers, and surely they thought we were. That's not real. People were afraid of Israel. Just talk to Rahab in the, in the Haftorah portion this week. Israel had a reputation. God had done fantastic, amazing things for Israel. What is that? Why did they do that? Because the cars were racing down the interstate, then they threw their super-powered electromagnetic on. And they got dragged. And from that limited perspective, from that little hole in the bushes, literally, maybe, they saw them through a little hole in the bushes and said, oh my gosh, look at those big people. Their inner thoughts created a story from that limited perspective. The people are big, and that ruined everything. And that never had to happen. This was avoidable. But their thoughts, yes, they saw big people in the land. That was a fact. That was a real input source. That happened. That was real. There are big people there. There, there are big people there are big people there. OMG, there are big people there. You know what that means? You know what that means. We're doomed. We're done. We can't take this land, and you know what'll happen if we try. You know what'll happen if we try. They're going to take our women and children. They're gonna, we're going to be grasshoppers. These are the princes of Israel, the mighty men who are now grasshoppers. Went from leaders to grasshoppers. Where? In their own mind. Nowhere else. And they told everyone, and everyone allowed their thoughts then to create a scenario that would have never happened. Why is God taking us to the land to fall by the sword? Where does it say that? Our wives and children will be carried off. It would be better for us to go back to Egypt. Yes, that's it. We, we, let's go back to Egypt. It was so great. Let's go back to Egypt. We, we got to go back to Egypt. I'm being dramatic for point. This is our life when we allow the people I talked about last week to significantly impact our thoughts. Is there a time for counsel and listening? Absolutely there is. That's not the point. When we let a thought lead us down the road and build scenarios and hypotheticals around it, often from the through the bushes limited perspective, from a thought that pops into our mind or one that's planted there by someone else, when our thoughts have free reign, we lose the broader perspective of life. Like that hole where I could see this car, this car. It's like assuming that when I see that car for a millisecond passing through there, that I can construct an entire story of the people within that car. 
They're from here. They're going here. Why are they driving that fast? They're probably having a fight with somebody in the back seat. Where are they going? How, 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 what will they do when they get there? How long have they been driving? They're, how fast are they? I mean, from that? It's impossible. I saw them for less than half a second. That's, that's something that, that's sometimes what one thought can do instead of realizing that we might only be seeing the issue from the tiny hole. But sometimes we don't even need, and this is the amazing thing, sometimes we don't even need a negative input source to take us down this road. We do it to ourselves. I talked to you last week about a concept called foreboding joy. I'm familiar with it through psychologist Dr. Brene Brown, who spent a lot of time researching shame and, 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 and uh, foreboding joy. It refers to our tendency to sabotage moments of joy by anticipating and preparing for potential disappointment or loss. You hear that? The feeling of unease or anxiety that arises when we experience moments of true joy, instead of fully embracing and savoring these moments, we instinctively anticipate and fear their eventual loss or disappointment. We can't be happy and present. Foreboding joy is a mechanism we employ to shield ourselves from vulnerability and potential pain. We try to numb ourselves or prepare for the worst as a way to avoid being caught off guard by negative outcomes. We blow, ju just like we blow tiny, small worries or random thoughts out of proportion, we do the same sometimes with joy in our own lives. We catastrophize and imagine worst case scenarios that all undermine our ability to fully embrace those moments. And positive outcomes, listen, the land was before them they were there. Look, we've arrived. Here's the land. But what if the people kill us and take our children? This is not to say that we don't think or plan, but we do it with rationality and mastery of our thoughts. But what's really amazing about foreboding joy is that there is a reality. There's a tangible thing, a tangible good thing that's here, right in front of you. You've just experienced it. And you create a false reality. For instance, I just got a raise. Well, mazel tov. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the boss doesn't really like me. That I'm, I'm convinced the boss doesn't like me. And I'm probably what's going to happen here is I'm, he's going to start watching me more because they're paying me more. I'm going to have to like probably work later hours now. He's going to be looking for reasons. And if I'm having to be forced to work here late, I mean, what's going to be happening at my house? My wife's going to be incredibly unhappy. You know where this is probably going to end? My wife's going to leave. My kids will be on the street. You just got a raise, man. My daughter's getting married. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, well, but, but what, if, what if the guy is not who he presents himself as? What if he does something to her? Because I'm going to tell you something. If he does something to her, I will show up at the doorstep. I will break that door down and I will go in and I will hurt him. But what? What if I punch him in the face and he falls down and hits his ear on the corner of a piece of furniture right behind there where he dies? And then I go to jail <laughs> and I can't see my kids. Your wife's, your daughter's getting married, man. Dramatic for point, maybe we don't allow our thoughts to take us that far. But I assure you, for many, many, many people, they are being dragged down the interstate daily, connected to an 85 mile an hour semi truck. They have no control, they have no thought awareness, and they are ruled by thoughts and fears they've created that probably will never happen.
Michelle de Montaigne, my life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. The best version of you is not the version who controls your thoughts. That's not possible. I can't control the cars that are passing down the interstate. I have no impact. You can't control your thoughts. But the best, most happiest, successful, productive, high-powered disciple, example to the others, the best version of you is not the controller of your thoughts, but the master of them. The master, it's the you who with thousands of thoughts coming from external and random sources can recognize that as Kelly Eisner once told me, thoughts are not facts. If you're thinking of two plus two and that's four, that's a fact. That's not what I'm talking about. Most of our thoughts are not facts. And I don't need to waste time going, hitching myself to those thoughts to drag me down the road to a destination I never wanted to visit. The context is, of course, different, but the idea, the statement that Paul makes in 2 Corinthians, it's so famous, we take every thought captive and make it obey the Messiah. It's, it's, again, different context, but it's a fundamental truth of life, that statement. We take every thought captive, that when you do that, when you master your ability to manage and direct your thoughts away from the hypotheticals to the reality, you become someone new. And here's the promise I can give you. You ready for it? If you don't take your thoughts captive, they will take you captive and take you where you don't want to go. It's not a mysterious power. Well, man, you, you, where's God in this? Well, let me tell you something. God can't do this for you. God can't. It's your task. Anyone remember He-Man and the Masters of the Universe? It's one of my favorite cartoons when I was growing up. If you're, if you're my parents' age, you remember it because your kids watched it. If you're my age, you remember it because you watched it. And He-Man, he used to have, remember what he'd do? He'd take his huge sword and he would hold it up and go, by the power of Grayskull! And then... I have the power, remember it? Randomly in my thought mind, I'm thinking back to He-Man when I'm talking about this and I say, by the power of my skull, <laughs> I have the power to master my thinking. God can do so much for you and he will strengthen you and he will push you along and he will be your advocate and your, your best guiding force. But what can he do when you latch to the interstate cars and you keep on doing it? What can he do? It's your task. No matter what the spies are saying, it's a, it's, it's a discipline. You want to be able to lift your sword and say, I have the power, it's a discipline. It's a discipline every single day, sometimes minute by minute, sometimes second by second. If you are descending into a thought whirlpool vortex, it's an awareness to say, no, 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 by the power of my skull, I have the power and the spirit that is within me, which is really where the power comes from. And there could not be, I promise you, my friends, when I start yelling and pointing fingers, I promise you there could not be a more self-directed message than this one to me. In my world of 
being in front of people and interacting with people and having to present myself as perfect and all these other things which I abandoned a long time ago. I am so easily led down the interstate of negative thought. So I'm not shouting at you, we're sharing in this. This is my life. And it's your life, I'm certain, at times. And I know that whether or not you want to admit it, most people have spies kinds of lives. I mean, you look around and you say, yeah, it's good, it's really good. But, however, however, or, or what did they mean by that? What, why did they say that? What, what do you think they meant? What, what? It's not helpful. So I'll task you. Examine your thoughts and ask yourself, before you construct a false reality, you ask yourself two questions. Is there a real factual basis for what I'm thinking or feeling? Am I hitching myself to a car traveling 80 miles down the interstate and getting dragged somewhere? Ask that question first, at least, if anything, breathe and think. And if the answer to that is, yes, there's something, if it is a real worthwhile consideration, then you ask yourself, what can I do about it? Do I need to do something, change something, address something, take an action? And if so, decisively take the action and be done. Take control of your life for God's sake and your own. If there's nothing you can do, let the car speed on down the road. I promise there's another one right behind it. The people of Israel were afraid. And so are most people who are controlled by their thoughts. They're afraid. It's not a criticism. Now, I'm not talking about psychological disorders and different things. There are clearly exceptions to what I'm saying. I'm talking about for most of us with a, with a normal, rational mind, right? Fear. Fear. There's a vicious cycle. When we live in fear of criticism, of failure, of the opinions of others, of measuring up to others, even of pain, of suffering, of loss, this vicious cycle occurs where fear then affects your thoughts, which build more fear, which affects your thoughts, which, ooh, woo, talk about a vortex. The thought-fear vortex. Somebody write that down. I'm going to come back to that another day. I like it. Again, Michel de Montaigne, great philosopher. A man who fears suffering is already suffering from what he fears. That's good, but I have a favorite Rabbi, Rabbi Nachman quote. It's a, it's a very famous Jewish summer camp song, but it's a, it's a lifeline for mindfulness. The whole world is a narrow bridge, but the essence is to not be afraid. The truth really, really is summed up best by Yeshua. He was the master teacher. Don't worry, he said. Think about that line. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough surus, has enough difficulty of its own. Think about that line. It, if you really think about it, it's not very helpful. It's not very, like, it does, it's not real encouraging, but it is. Don't ignore the fact. Don't, don't ostrich, ostrich head yourself. Don't ignore the fact that the world has trouble. And yet, don't be fearful or controlled by thoughts of what if. Tune in or miss out on the blessing of life that's occurring around you right now. The line between holding on and letting go is indeed, it's, it's very fine, like we were talking about, second by second sometimes. It's a split-second decision, taking practice to become a master. 
But again, this is, you can call this quote central for this message. This is an anthropologist, Carlo Castaneda, who said, the trick is in what one, what in, the trick is in what one emphasizes. We either make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves happy. The amount of work is the same. So I want you to remember that picture out my window. I want that to sink into your mind and become a permanent anchored thought. I want you to think about it. I want you to visualize that in your daily life and consider your thoughts over the next week. Evaluate them. Pay attention to what's going on in your space. Pay attention to your random thoughts. Pay attention to where your thoughts are taking you, especially when you find yourself lost in thought or being dragged down the road. Stop and ask, am I the master of my thoughts or do they master me? And remember, He-Man and Rabbi Nachman and Michelle de Montaigne and Yeshua and all of them and this last one who I... Love this guy, very non-traditional for a religious service. Eknath Eswaran, who was a Hindu meditation teacher who, who, who loved all of the different religious cultures. He wrote two commentaries on Yeshua's writings and teachings. But he says, a calm mind has great power. It generates calm around it a field of peace in which anger, fear, and violence subside. By learning to calm the mind, each of us can become an instrument of peace for you and for others. Who wants it? Everybody should want it. And know that God has given us the power to be the master of our thoughts. I can't emphasize it enough. The ability to not let them get you down and live the best life you can imagine is contained within that ability. So, may God strengthen you as you strive to live the abundant life which we were promised in Messiah Yeshua under the guidance of the, po of the power of the Holy Spirit and of you being the master of your thoughts. Happy Father's Day, guys. Shabbat Shalom. Let's stand. עלינו לשבח לאדון הכל, לתת גדולה להיות סר בראשית, שלא עשנו כגויי הרצון, ולא שמענו כמשפחות האדמה, שלא שם חלקנו כהן, וגור עלינו ככל המונם, ואנחנו קוראים ומשתחווים ומודים, לפני מלך מלא המלכים. הקדוש ברוך הוא, שהוא נוטה שמיים ועושה לארץ, ומושב יקרו בשמיים ממעל, ושכינת עוזו, ושכינת עוזו, בגובי מרומים, הוא אלוהינו אין עוד, אמת מלכנו אפס עולתו, כך כתוב בתורתו, וידעת היום, וידעת היום, והשבות הלבביך, כי אדוני הוא האלוהים, בשמיים ממעל, ועל הארץ, ועל הארץ, מהתחתנו. ונאמר, וחיה אדוני למלך על כל הארץ, ביום ההוא, ביום ההוא, יהיה אדוני אחד, ושמו, ושמו, ושמו אחד. ושמו אחד.
On that day, the Lord will be one, and his name will be one. I want to invite, you can sit down for one second. I want to invite Cody and Kristen Leckberg to come up here real quick. I don't have all their kids with them, and they didn't know I was going to have them do it. But I want to introduce you, for those of you who don't know Cody and Kristen, you can stand right in the middle. It's the hot seat. It's the hot seat. Everybody looks at you and, no. What are you thinking they're thinking about you right now? (laughs) They're all judging us. In 2016, we had the pleasure of welcoming uh, Darren and Sabrina Huckey, who, led by the Lord, relocated to Macon, Georgia, to come to Nechamu Ami Messianic Synagogue and become a part of this family and to serve here. After that, they inspired Lance and Emery Slater, who also relocated their entire family to Macon, Georgia, to come and be a part of the family and serve here. And so, a couple of years ago, I was going to have you tell your whole story, but I forgot to do it before I spoke, so now I'm just going to summarize it. Is that okay? A couple of years ago, they saw a video somewhere, some snippet from some Torah portions thing from First Fruits of Zion, and they showed up here, and they got busy. And they started investing and becoming a part of the family. But on Wednesday, they officially became part of the family as they relocated their family of six people to Macon, Georgia, to be a part of the Shalom Macon community. Kristen is the director of the Shalom at Home part of Shalom Macon, our online ministry, that, our online platform that's so valuable for so many people around the world. Cody, he encourages Kristen a lot. No, I'm just kidding. Cody is uh, about to start his real estate career in Macon, and Cody has a lot that he can and will bring to the community, already has. So I want to give you guys a quick blessing and just say that we're thankful to welcome you officially in. And listen, if you're not weird, you can move here too. (laughs) You're a little weird. You have, everyone in the room is a little weird or you wouldn't be in the room. You have to have the normal, appropriate amount of weirdness to be here, okay? Father, I ask for your blessings upon this couple and their four beautiful kids. I ask that you will prosper them in the decision that they've made to be here. I pray that you will grow them strong in their faith as disciples of Yeshua and that in that they would affect many, many, many lives for the good of the kingdom. May this happen by the power that you have given us within the Ruach HaKodesh. Father, bless them and keep them. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. I was sat there and I said, who would have thought walking through those doors would have changed our life? That's, she said as she was sitting there, I thought when we walked through the doors, or she said, When we walked through those doors two and a half years ago, who would have thought that it would have changed our lives? That kind of stuff makes the work that Kelly and I do and what my parents have settled here and founded in Macon, that makes it all worthwhile. Every single one of you, okay? It's not, I'm not saying you have to move here. I'm saying every single one of you. But those kind of life-changing things that are happening all over the world because of this little place, it's God. It's God, but we get to participate. Baruch Hashem. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Hashem Yeshua. Yivarechecha Adonai vayishmarecha Yoer Adonai panavelecha vihuneka Yisa Adonai panavelecha Vyasem lecha Shalom Shabbat Shalom, my friends. You have the power.